I'm honored to be with you via Zoom. I fondly remember spending a sabbatical at NC's over 20 years ago. The first part of this talk reviews some natural variation in gender expression and sexuality that is either not sufficiently known or is problematic for evolutionary theory. The second part calls attention to a definition of sexual selection that was developed during a workshop I organized at Nescent in 2013 and contrasts this definition with one recently proposed by David Schuker and Carlotta Cavarnamo. This slide illustrates geckos from Pacific Islands that reproduce asexually. Many species of vertebrates, including lizards and fish, reproduce asexually. Asexual reproduction may be obligate or facultative in vertebrates. Facultative asexual reproduction occurs in snakes, varanid lizards, birds, and sharks. Asexual reproduction provides an upper bound to the costs of sex that a species should tolerate. For example, if the so-called battle of the sexes becomes sufficiently deleterious, then an evolutionary option, and in some species a behavioral option, is not to bother with sexual reproduction and to reproduce asexually instead. To the contrary, the decision to reproduce sexually is a decision to cooperate, to mix genes rather than to clone. The overarching benefit to sexual reproduction is that the arithmetic average fitness through time for a sexually reproducing species is higher than the geometric mean fitness through time for an asexually reproducing species. This insight underlies W.D. Hamilton's 1980 special case in which the fluctuations in fitness through time were attributed to host parasite oscillations. Sexual reproduction has evolved over asexual reproduction to realize a higher long-term fitness in a fluctuating environment. There is no reason to accept the hypothesis that sex evolved to eliminate bad genes from the gene pool. Thus, sex starts with cooperation. This slide shows a human egg with human sperm, illustrating the size difference between these two types of gametes. The biological definition of male and female applies to all living things from seaweeds to sea lions. Namely, a male is an individual that makes solely sperm throughout its life, a female is an individual that makes solely eggs throughout its life, and a hermaphrodite is an individual that makes both eggs and sperm during its life, either at the same time or at different times. By definition, the sperm is the smaller gamete and the egg is the larger gamete. Therefore, the origin of the distinction between male and female rests with the origin of a size difference between gametes called anisogamy. Anisogamy evolves as a strategy to increase fertilization rates. That is, the more gametic contacts, that is, more gametic contacts occur in seawater when a cloud of large gametes is intersected by a cloud of small gametes than by two clouds of medium-sized gametes intersecting each other. There is no reason to accept the hypothesis the hypothesis of Parker, Baker, and Smith in 1979 that, quote, males are dependent on females and propagate at their expense, as in a parasite-host relationship, unquote, and that, quote, primordial sexual conflict concerned the origin of anisogamy itself, unquote. The origin of male and female does not represent a battle of the gametes. Given the origin of anisogamy, the next conceptual issue is how these gametes are packaged into bodies, both egg and sperm together in one body, called hermaphrodism, or eggs in one body and sperm in another body, called diese. A simultaneous hermaphrodite produces both sperm and eggs at the same time. A sequential hermaphrodite produces eggs and sperm at different times. Sequential hermaphrodites come in two varieties, male first, then female, versus female first, then male. Sequential hermaphrodites change sex during life. That means, by definition, 
they transition from making sperm to making eggs or vice versa. Furthermore, some fish multiply switch, for example, changing from juvenile to male to female and then back to male. Most plants are hermaphroditic. Only about 6% of plant species have separate sexes. Most animals have separate sexes. Only about 6% of all animal species are hermaphroditic. On the left are blue-headed wrasses, a species with some individuals who change from female to male. In the middle are clownfish, a species with some individuals who change from male to female. And on the right are hamlets, a species with individuals who are simultaneously male and female. Hamlets do not self-fertilize. The figure depicts the mating dance, where is, wherein one fish releases eggs and the other releases sperm. They then turn over and reverse roles. Hermaphrodism is the primitive condition and diese is derived, although in some lineages and some ecological conditions, diese reverts back to, her to hermaphrodism. Generally speaking, the advantage to evolving from having both eggs and sperm in the same body to having specialized carriers of sperm and eggs is efficiency in locating partners. In fish, parental care of eggs is usually provided by males. On the bottom is a pipefish from a group whose tubular bodies resemble a flute. In pipefish, the males glue the fertilized eggs to their bellies while they swim about. Seahorses are derived from, from pipefish. In seahorses, the males have a skin flap on their bellies into which females deposit their eggs, causing the male to become, so to speak, pregnant. As a result, females in some seahorse species can produce eggs faster than males can give birth to the eggs they are incubating. Hence, the females can mate with more males than males can mate with females, so that the males become choosy and females promiscuous, called sex role reversal. Sex role reversal is theoretically important because it demonstrates there is no connection between gamete size and sex role. A common sexual selection narrative is that with rare exceptions, males are passionate and females coy, to use Darwin's unfortunate terms, because males with their cheap sperm can afford to play around, whereas females with their expensive eggs stand to lose their reproductive investment if they mate with a genetically inferior male. Now, sex role reverse species demonstrate that either sex can be promiscuous or choosy regardless of gamete size, thereby invalidating claims of a connection between gamete size and sex role. Can animals have gender, or is gender reserved for humans? I take gender to mean the morphology, behavior, and life history of a sexed body. A quote, sexed body, unquote, is a body classified with respect to the size of the gametes produced. Now, for species in which most males have certain traits and most females have other traits, a few females may also be found to have female traits and a few males to have a few females to have male traits. This situation allows for what has been termed transgender animals. The best studied example occurs in sun angel hummingbird species from the Andes. Male sun angel hummingbirds have colorful feathers on their throats called a gorget, as illustrated in the slide. A female with a gorget is referred to as a masculine female. It also has a comparatively shorter bill. Conversely, feminine males also exist with a longer bill. Males use their gorgets in territorial defense of the common short flowers that fit short bills. Masculine females can, like the males, also defend territories of short, short flowers. Conversely, the feminine males have longer bills than masculine males. Feminine males use different flowers from the masculine males, namely relatively rare, long, tubular flowers that do not need to be defended in a territory. What is theoretically important is that gender expression indicates occupation and transgender birds are those whose occupation crosses into the occupation typical of the other gender. This slide, which I took in 2018 during a safari to South Africa, 
illustrates two male elephants mating. Charismatic megavertebrates often feature same-sex mating as do over a hundred bird species. And you can see the uh, penis on both of these uh, animals indicating that they're both males. This slide shows male-male mating in rams and lions. The sequence in the top right was given to me by a Brazilian photojournalist. They show one male lion soliciting a mating from another male and then proceeding to a male-male mating. You can see right here, this, this lion approaches this one, displays to it, nuzzles it, and then the one, the, the lion on the right, then approaches and mounts the, the male who had solicited it. They get up and, um, and then move apart. And this slide, the bottom two photos show that same-sex mating occurs in lions in the presence of a female. This is a female here without a lion's mane, and these are two males. Bonobos are our closest living primate relatives, as shown in the primate family tree at the lower left. In August 2021, just last year, I visited the Appenhoel Zoo in Holland to photograph bonobos. The top slide shows the bonobo habitat at the, at the zoo. The bonobos spend the night in the structure at the top left. Each morning, the zookeeper in the center bottom distributes food. Then the bonobos exit their structure to forage for food as shown in the lower right. The top left shows the clitoris of a subadult bonobo. The placement of the clitoris facilitates a form of same-sex mating called GG rubbing, where the females rub their clitorises with each other, leading to orgasm accompanied with squeals of pleasure. To alleviate conflict over the food scattered across the habitat, the females carry out lots of same-sex mating in various positions. The top right is face-to-face -face lying down. The bottom left is face-to-face -face sitting up. The bottom right is back-to-back. -back. And the top left and center illustrate still more female-female mating positions, back-to-front and genital touching. Female bonobos could write their own Kama Sutra. Lest one think bonobo behavior is irrelevant to the human experience. The photo at the top right is the, is the primate family tree extending to humans. Bonobos, along with the common chimp, are our closest living primate relatives. The bottom left is the famous 1974 specimen of Australopithecus afarensis, known as Lucy, that was discovered in Ethiopia by Donald Johansson. Notice that the head size and height agree with the bonobo, but Lucy is more bipedal. The lower right shows a hominum family tree illustrating how the genus Australopithecus gave rise to the modern genus Homo. There is speculation in the literature that the placement of the human clitoris might reflect its evolutionarily prior use in female-female mating, a morphological configuration that I term the mark of Sappho. The widespread occurrence of same-sex mating in animals is no longer news to biologists. What to make of it is not so clear. In my view, same-sex mating belongs with many forms of affiliative behavior, including mutual grooming in mammals, preening in birds, and excess heterosexual mating, as shown in the slide. These behaviors lead to the mutual exchange of physical pleasure. Making a big deal about same-sex mating reflects Western culture's fetishizing of sex. The theoretical interest lies with the entire class of mutual affiliative behaviors, not solely same-sex mating. I have proposed that affiliative behaviors underwrite cooperation. Carrying out cooperation requires coordination of activity, and the act of cooperation itself 
might be pleasurable. How to interpret affiliative behavior and mating behavior in general brings us to the topic of sexual selection. In 2006, in a science article with Errol Ache and Miko Oishi, as well as in later publications, I have argued that sexual selection theory should be abandoned as an explanatory framework in evolutionary biology. My view is illustrated in this slide wherein what was originally a possibly useful hypothesis to explain the evolution of male ornaments, such as the peacock's tail, has morphed over the years into a bloated and unfalsifiable doctrine of natural conflict, deceit, and sex stereotypes. Today's sexual selection doctrine is as useful is as useless to scientific process, progress as a three pound, $5,000 Swiss army knife is to carpentry. My wholesale rejection of sexual selection provoked a gang of over 40 sexual selection advocates to object in a science rebuttal to which we then responded. So to develop a constructive way forward, in 2013, I organized a workshop with 34 participants at Nescent in Durham, North Carolina, to assess the state of sexual selection studies and to suggest future directions. A miniature of the workshop's report is on the bottom left of the slide. A remarkable finding was that participants could not agree on the definition of sexual selection. Therefore, a subcommittee of participants worked to define a definition as discussed later. Then last year, David Schuker and Carlotta Cavarnamo reviewed the definition of sexual selection for the journal Behavioral Ecology. Their article confirms the nascent finding that no generally accepted definition of sexual selection exists. The miniature on the bottom right of the slide presents a full page from the article that was typeset in fine print and shows the many definitions of sexual selection presently in use. Schuker and Kavarnamo also presented their own definition, which I will now contrast with the Nescent definition. Schuker and Kavarnamo write, quote, our main aim in writing this paper is to allow the next generation of sexual selection researchers to address the many questions still left unanswered without the baggage of the definition of sexual selection left lying around." Unquote. I agree with this aspiration and thank David Schuker and Carlotta Cavarnamo for their constructive contribution. The Nescent definition and the Schuker and Cavarnamo definition hereafter abbreviated as the SK definition, agree on two main points. First, the long-standing association of sexual selection with sex roles and ornaments, including a relation of gamete size to sex role, is discredited and jettisoned once and for all. Both definitions are sex neutral. This is huge. Second, the definitions agree that a distinction is needed between sexual selection and natural selection, or more specifically, between sexual selection and the fertility component of natural selection. The Nescent and SK definitions do not formulate this distinction in exactly the same terms, but the intent seems similar. The Nescent report explains the distinction in this way. Consider a female with a fixed clutch. If the bird chooses one male over another because of its color, then sexual selection occurs. Alternatively, suppose the bird has a variable clutch, which depends on resources provided by the male. Then if the bird chooses one male over another because of the quantity of resources it supplies, then both fertility selection and sexual selection occur together. Both male and female prosper from the increased clutch, and additionally, the male prospers because of being selected over males supplying fewer resources. Both Nescent and SK call for new 
statistical methods to partition data on courtship behavior into its natural and sexual selection components. Furthermore, with both definitions, sexual selection is restored to its status as a specific hypothesis for how selection shapes mating behavior rather than as a far-reaching doctrine about sexual reproduction generally. The Nessent and SK definitions do have points of disagreement, however. First, the Nessent definition sees mating as serving both social and reproductive, reproductive roles, whereas the SK definition sees mating as the vehicle for access to gametes. Second, the, the Nessent definition sees selection as increasing fertilizations via negotiated and coordinated cooperation. This is illustrated in photos of biparental care in albatrosses and penguins that I took in the Falklands, South Georgia, and, that, and Antarctica in 2019. In contrast, the SK definition sees selection as winning at competition for mates. Both definitions define evolutionary success as an increase of genes in the gene pool, but differ on the behavioral mechanisms to attain that increase. I think it's a mistake for SK to stipulate the word competition in their definition. The definition should be neutral about competition and cooperation. Because the nascent definition is neutral about the behavioral mechanism underlying sexual selection, and the SK definition is not, the nascent definition should be preferred to the, sec to the SK definition. To stipulate competition as the mechanism of sexual selection, as SK have done, invites two theoretical traps. First is the need to, co to view cooperation as really competition in disguise. For example, by claiming Two, male, two males are really just competing when offering different degrees of cooperation to a female. This phrasing privileges competition over cooperation. Second is the need to specify an object of competition, which SK do with a distinction between gametes and resources as the objects of competition. More generally, Courtship behavior is not about competition for objects, but is a system for offering bids in the exchange of fitness, as the next slide discusses. The Nessent report illustrates how to test whether behavior is cooperative or competitive in the context of models for specific situations. For example, consider a male who allocates time into helping a female produce eggs versus guarding, and consider a female who allocates time into foraging versus being available for mating. The reproductive pie is the clutch of eggs. Fecundity selection on the male favors increasing the size of the pie by helping the female. Sexual selection on the male incre favors increasing the fraction of that pie that he sires. The slide illustrates male and female fitnesses for all possible time allocations. The right edge of the envelope shows the boundary along which no win-win solutions are possible, but instead Increasing the fitness of the male reduces that of the female and vice versa. The best compromise of time allocations for both parties is a green dot that is computed mathematically as the Nash bargaining solution. The non-cooperative time allocations are at a red dot that is computed mathematically as the Nash equilibrium, which is clearly worse, worse fitness for both parties. The threat of realizing the red dot motivates the male and the female to find time allocations that attain the green dot. So during courtship, the male and the female communicate their preferred time allocations and either adjust their own allocations accordingly or find other partners that do. 
If a model like this for a, specific, for a specific situation is made quantitative, then the predicted time allocations can be compared with the observed allocations, thereby testing for the existence of a cooperative versus competitive breeding arrangement. Furthermore, the exchange of physical pleasure provides a way to communicate a way to communicate the desired time allocations during courtship and to maintain or adjust those allocations afterwards. Thus, if the male and the female are playing competitively with each other, their allocations should match the red dot and no affirmative, no affiliative interaction should occur. Conversely, if they are playing cooperatively, their allocations should match the green dot and the cooperating pair should participate in continual affiliative interactions that impart a mutual exchange of pleasure to maintain the coordination needed for successful cooperation. Now most bird species are socially monogamous, perhaps as high as 95%, many of which provide parental, biparental care to their chicks. Hence courtship in most birds is predicted to be primarily cooperation rather than co rather than competition. Many of my thoughts in this seminar are traced to my book Evolution's Rainbow, published 18 years ago in 2004. The book has sold well and has been translated into Korean, Portuguese, and Spanish. My sequel, The Genial Gene, was published five years later in 2009 and is also available in French. All in all, the future of sexual selection studies looks promising now that the basic issue of sexual selection's definition is finally being seriously considered. This will lead to more testable hypotheses and more convincing science. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you.